everyone. I'm Pamela Marshall at the Wellness Radio TV and at the Wellness Radio TV podcast. Welcome to the Timbuktu Report, the show where our goal is to educate, enlighten, and inspire. And I promise you, today will not be any different. We will continue to do that. And the main reason that we can continue to do that is because of my guest, who is with us every week, Dr. Rick Stevenson, who is the African American history professor at the University of Florida. He is a student of uh, the word of God, a clergyman. He is uh, a scholar and a gentleman. Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you. you sometimes, sometimes those introductions make me blush. Aww. <laughs> I don't know if I ever told you this story uh, when I was in junior high school that a counselor told me that I wasn't smart enough to go to college. Really? And that I should get a trade. And um, Well, you did. Here we are five degrees later. and <laughs> Bye. You, you, you traded that energy into something positive. <laughs> right. So, uh, but thank you for the such a heartfelt introduction. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Excited. I think the color for today, huh? Yeah. yeah. It looks like we coordinated, doesn't it? They coordinated. Coordinated. <laughs> Dr. Stevenson, this is um, what, what used to be Negro History Week is now Black History Month. The accomplishments of the Negro in the United States of America under the uh, fear of Jim Crow laws, under the oppression of uh, slavery, under the oppression of systemic racism that still exists today. We're going to talk about these accomplishments and then ta also take a look at where would we be if it were not for the Negro in the United States of America, as well as what would things look like had the Negro been able to freely express him or herself with their gifts and their talents. Right. That's so that's good. What we're, I'm sorry. I said, that's good. That's what we'll talk about tonight. I thank you all so much who have joined us via Facebook and YouTube. Please like and share and bring somebody along so that they can be educated. And we, we started this Timbuktu report because we wanted to share information, not just in February, but every other day of the year. And we're so pleased to have this opportunity. As I said before, Dr. Stevenson is also a man of the cloth. And as we do every show, if you would take us to the throne. Yes. Lord God, we are, we are thankful, especially those of us who live in Florida, who do not have to deal with weather, especially the weather that is <clears throat> inundating the entire country. We, we bless you for safety. We pray for those men and women in Texas and and other parts of the country that are just without heat, without water. God, you are a true protector and provider. Your name is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And so we just ask you to provide for them, to send the necessary emergency help from wherever it needs to come from, that these people might not lose more lives. And we're having this problem in the midst of a pandemic, which makes it much more difficult. So we trust that even in the midst of these difficult times, you are still ultimately in, co in control. So we thank you that we can trust you in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. You real quick. <clears throat> so a couple of years ago, right, right, right after I finished my dissertation, I was at uh, the University of Houston presenting a paper and I met the director of the African American studies program there. They had a position open, which I applied for. And I never got the position and I was just devastated because I really thought that was a place that I wanted to, I wanted to go. About, about a year, about eight months ago, the director died uh, from COVID. What? Yeah. And then now they have this inundation with the weather. And I'm like, God, you knew even way back then that you'd rather have me in Florida than in Texas. Yeah. You know, wow, wow. Like, God, you're so much smarter than we are. 
And his ways are not our ways. His thoughts. His thoughts are not our thoughts. That's right. And, you know, I've had to learn how to pray. Father, let your will be done. And when your will is being done, help me to accept it. Amen. Dr. Stevenson, we're in the United States of America. And just as we think that nothing else can happen, we get hit with this storm. And my prayers, as you mentioned earlier, are with those family and friends of ours who are in Texas. My nephew, Sean, is in San Antonio in the military. Found out from his mom today, Dr. Keisha Reed, that he is, they've not had any power outages, but my friend Brunella Johnson and Jai, we pray for everyone that's there. And um, it's a difficult thing, but as we talk about San Antonio and we talk about African American History Month. It was in San Antonio when I learned that the Yellow Rose of Texas was actually a black woman, Hmm. Emily Morgan, Emily West Morgan. Hmm. And the song that everybody sings about the Yellow Rose of Texas was actually written by a black man. Hmm. So when we talk about African American History Month, uh, it is impossible I don't know that we will ever know of all the contributions of the African-American. No, we we probably, we probably won't, but thank God for Carter G. Woodson and his insight. You know, one of the things I think is important about African-American history month is that it's not just about black people. I've I've heard the, the, uh, a potential candidate for the governorship of Michigan say that, um, if he became governor, he would uh, prevent people from having African-American History Month. I heard uh, Morgan Freeman back in 2009, I think it was 2011, say that he thought that African-American History Month uh, wasn't necessary, that African-American history is American history, and it is. But what they fail to realize is that there was an organization called the United Daughters of the Confederacy that began in the late 1800s, early 1900s, controlling the publishing houses of textbooks in high schools, colleges, universities, and libraries. And in those textbooks, they determined what could be accepted history and what would not. And so, and, and, and a woman by the name of Mildred Rutherford wrote a document called A Measuring Ride for textbooks for colleges, universities. And in that measuring ride, it laid out what kinds of questions could be asked of the textbook. And if it didn't fall into those categories, it was rejected. For instance, if the textbook said that the Civil War was not about slavery, it was rejected. If the Civil War um, said that uh, the slave owners were cruel to their slaves, it was rejected. If the if the textbook said that um, that uh, Abraham Lincoln was a good guy and um, Jefferson Davis was not, it was rejected. And so, when you have that kind of control over the data that children are taught, that eventually become adults, then you have a, a major problem of undereducation. And and I think that even though Carter was Carter G. Wilson was hoping that black people would find their resilience in it. He was also saying to white people, hey, you don't know really what you, whose shoulders you're standing on. And that white America also benefits from African American History Month if we're willing to pay attention to it. And until it becomes an integrated part of our historical narrative, we need African American History Month. Dr. Rick Stevenson, I'm getting an echo in there again. I don't know what that where it's coming from. How's that? Yeah, that's much better. Cool. Uh, the the notion that uh, we want to make America great again, that thought and that image conjures up in the minds of many that it would be a place where just white people lived. Sure. So what would America be like with just white people? What would have happened in the United States of America? Well, they wouldn't have picked cotton. They wouldn't have picked the uh, rice. They wouldn't have harvested sugar. 
They probably wouldn't have picked the tobacco. I mean, think about it. Some of the vegetables that we eat today, yams, goobers, etc., plantains, they came from Africa. So a significant portion of the labor force uh, all the way up until the uh, um, uh, early 1800s, middle 1800s, um, the 1900s was done on, 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 on the shoulders of black men and women who would, who would clean the houses. My grandmother used to clean houses for white people. You know, so I mean, there is so much, there's so much of our, our American and, and global economy that is directly connected to slave labor. You know, uh, there's one, I can't think of the name of it right now. I, I wish I had, I wish I had thought about this earlier, but there's a document I was reading just recently, maybe about a month ago, and it was arguing that in the 1800s, like 1860, 1870, the American economy was worth like $2.6 billion. And the majority of that money that the economy was built on was built on slave labor from the cotton that was picked here in America and exported from the tobacco that was picked here. And then once sugar became a part of the diet, Jamaica and, and the Bahamas and Brazil, all of that slave labor is what, what influenced the economy of the world. So I think that if we look at how much the, the, the American society as a whole has experienced um, the profits of black people, and then we look at it on a global scale, it would be an entirely different um, uh, conversation. So the, when, when people talk about why do we need African American History Month, um, why is it that we need to highlight these things? How does how has that narrative played into race relations? Uh, not having um, accurate information, not telling the truth. What sure. did it do to not tell the truth about the contributions of the Negro to it, America and its its yeah. establishments here? It, it placed black people uh, in what we call a deficit paradigm. For instance, uh, one of the leading medical pioneers in cholesterol studies sugars and protein studies was an African-American woman by the name of Dr. Marie Maynard Daly. She was born in, in Queens, New York in 1921. She's the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in chemistry from Columbia. Um, and, you know, she, she did studies on the effects of cholesterol on the mechanics of the heart. Why? Because black people tend to have higher cholesterol than white people. Why? Because of our diets. She studied the effects of sugars and other nutrients on health arteries and the breakdown of the circular system. Why? Because, because, because the kinds of physical issues that we experience, like hypertension and so on, is oftentimes unique to our community and to our diet. You look at the Black Panther Party, for instance. One of the reasons that studies on sickle cell anemia became important is because so many black people were suffering from sickle cell disease and the Black Panther Party is the one who started these um, inner city centers to test people for sickle cell. So it's those kinds of things that are prevalent in the African-American community that African-American people pay attention to that the dominant culture doesn't pay attention to because it oftentimes does not affect them. And so then, the, con <clears throat> go ahead, the contribution. But then you can even go to the smaller things like cooking utensils. I don't know if you're familiar with Anna Magina. She was, uh, she invented the spatula in 1892. Now, how many of us have used a spatula? Most of us at one time or another. And yet, who's one today? No, that <laughs> an instrument that you use to flip your hamburgers <laughs> and your and your pancakes was actually invented by a black woman. So my point is that so many of us uh, are experiencing on a daily basis the influences and the contributions of people of African descent, and we don't know it because it's not in the textbooks. And that's why Black History Month was so important because 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 Woodson really desired to create a system where we were constantly adding to the catalog of African-American contributions and influences on American society and the world. Why do you think that 
the Negro was able to accomplish so much in spite of what they went through. When I was in Charleston, South Carolina, a couple years ago, and walking around Charleston and seeing the structures, the houses, there's one black man who died recently, who's credited with designing the majority of the wrought iron that you see in Charleston. Um, and, and they were rented out there. They had slave tags. We may have talked about that. They had slave tags. They were leased out to be able to do work. And um, I, they had to be, they were identified by these slave tags, like the tags that uh, people in the military fighting in the wars would have. Right. And so when I look at those structures and I think about, man, these people were out working and designing and being creative, yet they knew that they were not gonna be able to keep what they worked for. And right. they were gonna go back to horrible conditions. Oh my and, goodness. And they were still able to achieve. What is it about the Negro that still is able to work under these kinds of conditions? Um, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, it's it's pretty much in our DNA to invent. I take a, a perfect example. The Timbuktu report is named after a city in West Africa, country in West Africa, Mali, where the first university, the University of Sankor, was located. And as early as the seventh and eighth, ninth century, we have now discovered over 700,000 handwritten documents that cover everything from science to botany to cartography to architecture to economy, economics, finance, you name it, Africans are writing about it. You travel to the northeastern part of Africa and you look at the, the pyramids in your um, in, in our background, there's a big pyramid. Those pyramids were created by African people. The Egyptians were not white people. The Egyptians were Africans. And that kind of engineering, engineering, the understanding of the solar system, these kinds of things have been a part of our DNA forever. And just because uh, we were brought here from the west coast of Africa and many of our ancestors were actually brought from the interior to the West Coast and then brought here. We didn't forget who we were. We didn't forget Africa. We didn't start losing our sense of Africa until we were born here and didn't know the motherland, right? Until our parents were uh, enslaved and then the children were born in the American continent. Uh, so, and it took a minute for that memory loss to take place. But I'll tell you one more thing. That, no, no, no. Con conclude this part. The dominant culture was really slick in the way they developed this system of amnesia. There's a book uh, called the, the American Uprising by uh, Rasmussen, and he argues that the brutality that took place during this particular uprising in 1711, 1811, it was so horrible that the, the politicians, the plantocracy, and the scholars got together and said, we're never going to write about this. We're not going to put this in the textbooks. And they say that the brutality was so bad that where they cut these guys' heads off and put them on poles, they cut their legs off and throw them in the water, in the ocean. It was so bad that they said, we don't want anything, anyone to know about it, so we're not going to write about it. And as long as people control the master narrative, we... And we, and we don't get these stories like you and I are having right now. We don't know the successes that we've had, right? right? But it's already in us, right? Our, the ability, that innateness of survival in the midst of oppression, it's been a part of who we've been ever since we've been on the planet. We just need to tap into it. I try to tell my students, never, you know, when I first started water skiing and, and snow skiing and scuba diving, people would ask, why are you doing white people's sports? And I would say to them, sports have nothing to do with race. They have to do with exposure. Right. Access. I showed my students five uh, black women today, all who have PhDs. And I said to them, if you can't see it, you can't be it. That's the issue. 
The issue is not that we don't have it in us. We just have to see it so we can recognize, oh, I can do that. Well, I want to try that. Or maybe if I have an opportunity, I can do this. So that's what it is. I think it's it's something in us that has to be ignited by people who are exposed beyond our individual limits. Well, actually, when I look at the abilities of the street entrepreneurs who cannot, who had better not keep record on um, <laughs> the computer software, QuickBooks. They can't, yeah. keep, they can't keep their information on QuickBooks. The information is here. Exactly. And they're managing businesses that would rival Fortune 500 companies. Right. They, they could probably outshine many people sitting at the mahogany table because those people are depending on the computers. These guys have it in here. And if they would just shift that. But part of part of that, I believe, uh, Dr. Stevenson, is when you look at where the Negro was around the turn of the century mm -hmm. after the Emancipation Proclamation, mm -hmm. that we started our own economies in right. in the in the limitations of segregation mm -hmm. and were thriving, but was met with such opposition because I read in an article that was written right after the Emancipation Proclamation that said the Negro would be relegated to the insignificance of American society, much in the same way the Native American was. That's what they had hoped. Exactly. But the challenge is when you are from the beginning of civilization, and even though we may not have conscious memory, Mm -hmm. But we do have the DNA memory, and that's why, in spite of, you look up and go, how did that Negro get in the White House? Exactly. How did that one get past us? <laughs> exactly. And his wife. And his wife. Exactly. You know, how does that them, happen? Both of them graduating from Ivy League universities, you know, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia. Come on. Um, you make a good point when you go when you talk about the the end of Reconstruction and the the entrepreneurship of African Americans, and then how how we are we're we are pushed out of communities. We are not in, not invited into the university. We're not allowed to build homes in various areas. And so when we create our own and it becomes so fantastic, now they want to tear it down. You're talking about the, 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 the red summers of 1917 through 1921. They're all across this country, Texas, here in Florida, uh, Rosewood, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921, Black Wall Street. I mean, you, you say white, white America doesn't want us to participate with them. So we say, okay, fine, we'll do it ourselves. And then when we do it ourselves, then you say, no, now you think you're uppity. I mean, what do you want, right? White supremacy is so fickle. Racism is so fickle that, that it is not only destroying the country, but it's, it's also destroying the people who are promoting it. Imagine what America would be if America embraced all of the gifts and talents of the African-American. Amazing. You talk about a powerhouse and mm -hmm. it should not be about, you know, you're married and there are times that there are conversations, your wife may have an idea about something. And then, you know, a week later you decide that it's a great idea, but nobody is going to fight you because it's now a great idea that the seed was planted. And what we want to do is get things accomplished. Exactly. And if we looked at the United States of America as a place where we're trying to get things accomplished as a whole, exactly, it doesn't matter who's doing it. If you want it to be does. a superpower, tap into the resources that you already have with the people that you already have, rather than trying to further minimalize, degrade all the black men that are locked up in jail today. Imagine if they were in had the opportunity to be in corporate America. Exactly. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, your neighborhood pharmaceutical salesmen, those people are keeping these numbers and these systems running on a consistent basis in their minds. 
Mm -hmm. Imagine what would happen if they could do that uh, without f the fear of being incarcerated, brutalized, beaten up. But I'll show you another, another thing why it's important to um, for African American History Month and African Americans to to do their own research. It, it's because of the diabolical nature, I think, of separatism and white supremacy. Uh, I teach a course, um, the introduction of African American studies. And one of the things I talk about, especially during the 60s, uh, is the role of infiltration of a government that wants to continue to oppress. And we look at, you know, Herbert Hoover and the way he uh, in infiltrated the Black Panther Party. But also now, in 2006, the FBI came out with a report that talked about how uh, white supremacist organizations were infiltrating the military and police departments. I mean, it is it is still the motivation of white America to oppress black people. And the question is, why is that? What what is it about us that constantly uh, that constantly challenges them to need to be in charge? Why, what is it about African-Americans and our stability, our ability to sustain ourselves under oppression that they hate so much? If we could get to the bottom of that question, because it can't be because we haven't contributed. It can't be simply because of skin color. It's got to be something else. And what is it? Right. Because if we can answer that question, I think that some of the other problems might fall in mind. Carrie Knox Carrie in Jackson, Jackson, Tennessee, is watching. She said, in spite of all limitations, we rise, we create, we invent, and we continue to support the majority economy. She's the AKA. She sure is. Yeah, 06. <laughs> In the White House. <laughs> yeah, You're right. You, you talk about, um, you know, you, you try to keep me from accomplishing. I accomplish and still lift this country up. Yeah. And, and, and that's another important thing that um, I was reading something just recently, too, about uh, African-American soldiers who went and fought in France and Italy. Uh, they fought in the First and Second World War for freedom in those countries. And then when they came back home, that uniform became a target of murder and lynching and tar tarring and castration and, and 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 yet we still keep there's something about us that i think has just taught us that life will always have those valleys but still i rise so the the negro in the united states of america facing the challenges that we have faced and continue to face um and, and the narrative in the United States of America, United States of America only makes up 4.2% of the world's population, but the world has also allowed white people in the United States of America to tell them who black people are. Yes. And there's a whole continent called Africa. Exactly. That, that with, with thriving economies. Yeah, that they yeah. benefit from. Yet, yet we allow a narrative here in the United States of America to say who we are. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'll tell you, Dr. Stevenson, I really appreciate you uh, fitting this into your schedule because I think it's so important. It is critical that now that we have the opportunity to just tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Nobody's trying to put anybody down. Mm -hmm. Just tell the truth. Right, and as right. you and, and I would love, I invite some of my white classmates, some of the white viewers, I would love to have you on the show because I do want to know, how right. does my skin, what is it about me that pisses you off so much right. that you would rather destroy the democracy of this country than to oh, yeah. enjoy an opportunity that your forefathers put together so that this nation could truly be a great nation. Exactly. I, you know, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. I've, I've, 
I've asked that question of my mother, of my father when I was younger. What is it about me um, that white people hate? I remember, and my dad said, he said, son, it's not about you. He said, it's just their inability to be competitive with something that looks different. That's all he said to me. It was, he couldn't explain it because he experienced it, you know. And but but he said to me and my mother, I think I told you about this too. My mother, she started buying me books when I was seven years old. And uh encyclopedias, guy used to come around the house every week selling them. And she said, she said, Ricky, I can't do anything about your skin, but I can do something about your mind. Mm. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that you have as much access as possible so that you can be successful regardless of your skin. And, and I, I, I've lived, I've lived, I think, on that premise the majority of my life, understanding that all of my successes mean nothing to the average white person who still sees me as an N-word. But that's not the issue. The issue is, how do I see myself? And I think the problem with a lot of white people is how do they see themselves in relationship to themselves, but also into relationship to people that they have been taught to hate. Taught. Taught to hate. Miss right. Wilkinson, thank you for watching. She says, this is such a beautiful conversation. Really appreciate you watching and sharing. Start a watch party. This is uh, information I think that's vital uh, for us as well as others, I, you know, to have a very frank conversation. We talk about dealing with racism and the only thing that we will do in this country as it relates to dealing with racism, especially in corporate America, is hire a diversity coordinator. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Who has no idea oftentimes. But then and, and, and then take take your diversity coordinator to every event. And every time there's a question about black folks, you point right. to your diversity coordinator <laughs> as, as your, your diversity. Right. And we're still not dealing with the fact that um, the emotional and the mental illness of racism, because hate is a mental illness. Yes, it is. Yeah. To just hate people because of the color of their skin, yeah. and because we will not. <clears throat> there, there are some uh, psychologists who have identified racism as a mental illness, mm -hmm. um, but, but we don't talk about it. We uh, um, don't. We don't talk about it from that perspective that it is an emotional thing. Because mm -hmm. if I haven't done anything to you, and <clears throat> you are just emotionally attached to this anger. Exactly. The anger that we saw on January 6th, that cannot be classified as anything else except a mental illness. Exactly. And you know, another, another interesting thing about racism is how easily it can be contextualized when necessary. I, 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 I give you an example. So, I teach a course called Race, Religion, and Rebellion. Uh, and so the first section of the class, we start talking about race. And so I want my students to be able to identify how to define race, racist, and racism. Mm -hmm. So we do this experiment. So the first day of class, when I walk in, I have them all take out a sheet of paper and a pencil. And I say, okay, you got 60 seconds. I want you to write down the first three things that came to your mind when I walked into this office to the room. So you get everything from nice bow tie, dreadlocks, you're a black man, never had a professor, you're intelligent, you look confident, so on, so on, so on. Say, so, so okay, now if I walk into this room with sweatpants on and a hoodie, would you have had the same kind of assessment? They said, no. I said, why? I said, because the environment changed, right? Because I'm still a black man, but in a university that are co and teaching a course you signed up for, my blackness has been accentuated because the assumption is I'm intelligent. But this same black man could walk down the street with a pair of jeans on and a hoodie 
and be murdered because someone assumed he was a well yeah so let's talk about attire and how that has been used to identify and to categorize people of color mm -hmm. um, attire that is not based on who we are mm -hmm. because when you look at the the marches in the 50s and the 60s right. people had on their sunday best yes, they women did. had on shoes yeah. they didn't have on sneakers they had on shoes real shoes and stockings yeah the men had on suit coats and, yes. and sweaters and and so this whole shift in our attire mm -hmm. was not of our doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not, that is not who we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's the other part that we have allowed to change. Sure. So you're going to start marketing this look to us. Mm -hmm. And then in that look, we're going to start a narrative about what that look means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The politics well, of respectability. Right, right. You know, even even as I appreciate, you know, the, the fact that you have your bow tie on and your vest and your shirt. And I almost put on a denim jacket with this dress today. It's funny that we're talking about this. Mm -hmm. But I thought about my father. My daddy, who didn't have much, but his father wore a suit every day when he rode his wagon and his mule, his <laughs> Stacy Adams shoes, his exactly. Stetson hat, and sat very erect. So on behalf of my grandfather and my father, I don't participate in anybody's dress down day. Because mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. not who we are. Exactly. That is not who we are. When we look at um, hidden figures, the way those women were dressed. Yeah. That's who we are. Yeah. And we need to get back to who we are, who yeah. we, who we, not who we were. We're still that. And stop letting somebody else control the narrative of what we look like and what our wardrobe is going to look like. Cause that's not us. Exactly. We're kings and queens. We exactly. don't dress like that. Exactly. I was in, I was in, um, Senegal, West Africa, uh, about 10 years ago and and Senegal was colonized by the French so so the the lingua franca there is French there are all these African people who speak French and it's just beautiful but when you see them and, and it's a predominantly Muslim country so when you see the women they have their heads wrapped with kente and their dresses and their blouses are just beautiful. I mean, even working out in the fields, you <laughs> see vibrant reds and oranges and greens and blues. And, and the men, you know, they, they all have one that they, they, the outfit's called a, 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 a boo boo. It's a three piece um, outfit with, with a trouser, and then it has a, 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 a a tunic that comes over, and then another piece that comes over that you with, that you wrap a, a a piece of fabric over your right arm when you carry it. I have a couple of my bottom while I was there, and and what fascinated me was, no matter what they were doing, they looked like they were going to church. That's how we used to look. <laughs> you That's know? how we used to look when we were broke. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. and let me just tell you something. I'm going to say the word. I had a white man say to me, we would see a black person walking down the street and we would say to each other, look at that nigger walking like he got something. What he got to be proud of. Exactly. Because that's how we carried ourselves. Exactly. And it, it slipped in on us through this music through the attire on the in, in, in the the wardrobes, that's not who we are. That it's really not. is not who we are. It is not. And that, that gets portrayed as who we are. I was also in New Orleans at the Essence Festival, and I was getting a, an outfit to wear to my girlfriend's wedding. She was doing a um, an African theme wedding, and I said to the woman, 
that I needed uh, an outfit to wear to my friend's wedding because she was doing an African thing. She said, this is not a costume. <laughs> I get so sick and tired of Americans calling our attire a costume. <laughs> this is what we wear every day. Exactly. It is not a costume. I was so embarrassed. I was so ashamed of myself that I bought two. <laughs> Because she's right. Right. We uh, have forgotten that that's who we are. We don't, that other stuff that we're wearing, that's a costume. Come on now. Because that's not who we are. I wish I could, um, I, I collect photographs of, of black people attired, especially during the uh, late 1800s, early 1920s. I love that. I love the wide lapels, the wide leg pants, you know, the spats. I wish I could share my screen. We had some problems last time, but I, I have some photographs of black people, black men, black women, black kids dressed back in the 1900s, and they were sharp from head to toe. Oh, yeah. They probably didn't have two nickels in their pockets, but you couldn't tell. They represented, right? right? And what we fail to realize, and you mentioned this just a few moments ago that you know wearing these pants hanging down around our rear ends and you know uh the kind of attire that that's being promoted in our community that is not something that we designed no you know uh that is something that someone else designed to constantly remind us in their minds that they're better than we are right and and we did not stand up to that and, and corrected. Um, into I, it. Yeah, uh, Kat said that it can be a mental unbalance, but it's also racism is learned and taught. Definitely it is learned and taught, but when you embrace those emotions and those right. feelings, it is still about your mind. Exactly. It's, a, it's about the mind and how it operates. Even if it is taught, it is still about your mind. And we're not addressing that because I don't know that there is any, as I watch the speeches during this last couple of weeks of the impeachment hearings, mm -hmm. I don't know that there is a real desire mm. to rid the United States of wow. America of racism. I don't think that we have a desire to do that. I agree and, and for us to say this is not who we is, hmm, it is. It's definitely we are. And 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 Kat is right. There was I think you are you familiar with um the Dow test? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. That the purpose of that test was to reveal how racism is learned behavior. Right. 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 And so we, we do know that. But you're right. Jane Elliott, if I'm not mistaken, is the one who talks about racism being a mental illness. Mm -hmm. And one of the people, yes. Say again. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so I, I, I don't think it's either or. I think that it can be both. And and the only way in my mind to overcome it is through education. Right. But you can't do that unless you have access to the publishing houses. And then these publishing houses are now placing these textbooks and this information into the school system. Right here in, in, in Gainesville, the Alachua County school system just got an award for its role in introducing African-American studies into their curriculum because they realize that these young kids need to understand and have a better understanding of the historical narrative that is more inclusive than one that is exclusive. The contributions of African Americans are huge in the economies of this country, in the inventions of things that have made um, work uh, easier, even the cotton gin, the real McCoy. McCoy was a man, right. was a black man. Um, sanitary products were invented by a black woman. Right. Before, because we're going to run out of time, Dr. Stevenson, let's talk about, you talk about what 
schools need to do as far as racism is concerned. So much of what we're seeing right now that is helping to fuel racist attitudes in this country is coming from another institution called the church. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so, you know, we can get the textbooks right. Right. But when the person standing in the pulpit right. is condoning things that are contrary to uh, God's laws and his precepts, right. and those who are sitting in the congregations are embracing what is being said under the umbrella of Christianity, you know, there is no place that I've found that they said that heaven has been enlarged, it said that hell was enlarged. But when we, when we go to the church that we, the place that we call the house of the Lord yeah. and attitudes that divide us is the main course. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we address that when it's, when it's, you know, even I, I think about the organization called the proud boys. Well, the yeah. scriptures clearly speak against pride. Right. So right. can can we just agree that you ought not be a part of an organization <laughs> that is diabolically opposed to the teachings of Christ? Exactly. God hates and abhors the proud. Exactly. Yeah. So, I, so can we say that organization <laughs> is not in keeping with making it into heaven? I don't know. Right. I. The, the reason I laugh is because we we shifted in my class today from the race section to religion. And uh, Lawrence Mamiya and C. Eric Lincoln wrote a book entitled The, the, the African-American Church and the Black Community back in 1990, I think 94. And they said, if you really want to understand the people, you have to study their religion. So I asked the class what is religion and what is the purpose? And we got all sorts of answers. And so I said to them, so let me, let me, ask, you, let me ask you this question. If we're reading the Bible or if we're reading the Quran or we're reading any kind of spiritual text, is it possible for two people to read the exact same text and arrive at two different conclusions? And they said, yes. And I said, you're absolutely right. And what has to take it? has to be taken into account is the agenda of the person reading the text. So how is it possible for a white man to stand in a pulpit and say that black people should be slaves because the Bible says, slaves be submissive to your masters. When black people read that text, they're not hearing the same conversation, right? They're not using the same interpretation. Why? Because the agenda is different. And so we have to be careful that simply because some people have a nefarious or malevolent nature and are willing to justify and manipulate scripture doesn't mean we throw the scripture out. What we have to understand is that you cannot legislate a person's heart. Right. You can't legislate behavior. You have right. to trust that if a person is really seeking the truth, they'll read the text for its original purpose, right? and apply it so that we can be more of a community as opposed to a group of people who are trying to kill each other because our hair is kinky or our skin is dark. And, you know, that is a book that was approved by King James. I don't know that the creator of the universe thought that it was a good idea for another person to own another person because the scripture also says, oh, no man. Right. So if you own me, then I am indebted to you, not to the one that created me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, Dr. Stevenson, I can see you're cringing going, oh, Lord, Pamela, please. The, the, <laughs> the Bible says, oh, no, man, anything but a debt of love. It doesn't, the, 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 that passage is about finances and borrowing and getting in, into debt. It's not, you know. But if but if but if you own me, then I owe you a day's work because you own me and I'm not getting anything for it. But but, and, but 
I'm sorry, but see, contextually, and this this is what I was trying to get my class to understand, that that slavery in the first and second century was not necessarily a bad thing. There were some people who Paul says that he was a slave to Christ. He had a they they okay. used, there was a time where you would you would bore a hole in your ear, and that hole represented your submission to someone that you wanted to enslave yourself to. Why? One, because of the economies. There were more people than there were rich people. Sometimes Probably you could so. And Probably so slavery so. wasn't based on, I'm sorry? But, but, but overall, because of God's love and God created us for his good pleasure, uh -huh. not for man's good pleasure, uh -huh. I, I submit to you today, sir, that there is no reason for anybody to own anybody. And it may have happened in those stories, but that's not why God created us. I agree 100%. The word says he made us in his image and in his likeness. And his likeness is not to be held captive. I understand that 100%. And I agree 100%. But you can't negate the fact that sin exists. Oh, yeah. Those stories exist. But okay. that does not make it right. And so because because they're there and they're doing it and, and used it on us to keep us where they felt like we should be. It's, it's, it's um, <laughs> part, of, part of why we're where we are today, actually, Dr. Stevenson, in these organizations and the fact that so many African-Americans, and there's nothing wrong with uh, a cross section uh, in the congregation, but you need to be aware of what the message might be. I think those messages have caused some African Americans who are sitting under those messages and don't understand that these people are talking about you. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with, disagree with you, but I think that we have to constantly contextualize the conversation. For instance, when we look at the scriptures, slavery in those days was never based on skin color. Okay. We don't, we don't have that problem until the transatlantic slave trade. Even Africans had African slaves. They didn't make it right. No, it didn't make it right. But the point is, it was not necessarily demeaning because you could be a slave and marry into the family of the person who owns you or that you were a slave to. I use that. I shouldn't use the word own because because it, it was a part of the social structure. They didn't have the kind of financial and economic hierarchy. They didn't have the kind of inherited kind of growth in some places that we have. Today. So I get that. And I agree. Slavery is 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 completely diabolical. However, what happened in America was entirely different. Right. Because the enslavement was based on skin color. Mm -hmm. Right. The enslavement suggested a some a level of inferiority and it also came with this idea of perpetuity. That is not what the scripture said. And that's where I would place my argument. Gotcha. Gotcha. Ms. Wilkinson says here you can only submit yourself to someone when you truly see yourself in them. It is, as you said, it is not about being above and owning. Uh, only when you see God in each other, you can submit. Yeah, so that's not, that's not about owning, you know? Exactly. So, so, so the, the role, as we talk about Make America Great Again, when people used to get out of church <laughs> and have picnics under trees where a human was hanging, being lynched, yeah. And take pictures with bodies hanging yeah. from trees. That, yeah. that, that message of make America uh, great again is um, quite disturbing. Right. Because there are people who were hanging from those trees that look like me. Exactly. And the insurrection um, that took place on January 6th, that mob, it, it just took my mind back to what it must have been like during those times that those mobs of people would would uh, converge on a black community mm -hmm. and start burning buildings down, start mm -hmm. killing people, start mm -hmm. destroying their businesses. And 
that is alive and well today. Exactly. I think the question is, make America great again for whom? Because it wasn't great for the indigenous Americans. It wasn't great for black people. It wasn't great for the Chinese when they came here. It wasn't great for the Japanese. Who, so who is he talking about? Obviously, they're talking about white Americans. So what they're really saying is make America white again. And if it was just this show tonight is about looking at where we would be if the Negro had not been here and brought their gifts and talents and were able to accomplish um, things under uh, conditions that would have broken a lot of people. And we, still, and we still did it. And, and so who are some of those people real quick um, that we may not know about Dr. Stevenson? Um, you ever use the ironing board? Yes, sir. It was invented by a guy named Thomas Jennings. Uh, created the ironing board back in um, 1821. You got a pair of shoes and the soles sold on it. Jan Ertz Matzlinger. He invented the shoemaking machine uh, that increased shoemaking speed 900%. Um, it, it, it's, 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 it's people like uh, uh, Robert McNair, one of the first astronauts who died when that uh, ship blew up um, in uh, 19, what was it? 1986, I think it was. He was a physicist, right? Uh, these are the kinds of individuals that we owe our homage to and we don't know about it because it's not in in our textbooks. You look at and then let's go just go Greek. You look at organizations like Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, you would be surprised how many alpha men have been a part of government. Andrew Young, Thurgood Marshall. You look at uh, we'll look at um, uh, Carter G. Woodson, member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity. But when he was sick and in the hospital in Howard. A hospital in, in Washington, D.C., his primary doctor was a man of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, uh, Dr. Henry Arthur Callis. And so, you know, we, we, we engage in so many different arenas, it's difficult to just to, to pinpoint one aspect. I think that what we have to say is that African Americans have contributed, contributed to science, to music. Thomas Dorsey, look at the spirituals. Oh, my goodness. How many songs that we sing? You look at jazz. Jazz comes out of New Orleans. Um, what is it that we have not had our hands in? I would say virtually nothing. Even, and I mentioned this last week, and I was telling some guys, I played tennis yesterday, and, I, and one of the guys had a Lacoste, he had a Lacoste t-shirt on. And so I said to him, I said, so, um, so what do you think about Renee Lacoste? He said, who's Renee Lacoste? I said, He's a guy who made your T-shirt. He, he, they used to call him the crocodile. So yeah, I said, yeah. I said, did you know his mother was a, of Jamaican descent? He almost turned red, you know? So for all these years, he's been wearing this T-shirt, these polos that were created by a black tennis player and no one ever knew it. So that's why African American History Month is so important because it allows us to engage in these conversations that are not ordinary about the contributions of people of African and African American descent. And it is amazing, even as you think you might know, I'm echoing again, even as you think you might know, you still don't know. Right. There's so many, many contributions, even in our own families sometimes, mm -hmm. we find out about uh, people who were the first in our communities to do things. Uh, I think about in Jackson, Tennessee, Nell Huntsman was the first African-American woman on the radio, the woman that I looked up to. Hmm. And, and so many uh, who participated in things that brought about integration in our communities. Uh, Josette, thank you for watching. Josette's fashion show is February 28th. We all wanna make sure that we watch that and support it. Absolutely. She's a designer and a self-taught seamstress, comes from, you know, and, and, and thinking about her and Abraham Lincoln's wife's seamstress was the first black person uh, to publish a book, mm -hmm. first black woman to publish mm -hmm. a book. So Dr. Stevenson, 
I applaud you and what you're doing with your students in class and what you do, what you're doing in the community uh, around uh, the country um, in helping to share these stories. I invite our Caucasian brothers and sisters. If you don't know, take the time, call me up, call him, call somebody and ask. Sure. Because there is no reason for you to dislike me. <laughs> right, because I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm not gonna hurt you and you should not want to hurt me. Exactly. What is the upside of us being ugly and mean to each other? What is the upside of that? There is none. And for people who have encouraged it, people who have participated, as these people are now going to court and having to stand before the judges in their communities for themselves, I will tell you today that I guarantee you, whoever you're following will not be standing with you when you stand before our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. You will have to give an account for your mm -hmm. actions. I don't care what you were taught. I don't care if they were to what you were told. Mm -hmm. God is love. Yes, and if we're is. not loving each other, yes. then you're not on the Lord's side. I don't care what anybody says. Exactly. Ms. Wilkins says people have to uh, understand that they have to get past colors to see the bigger picture because a lot of our ancestors were white and black in previous times and in this lifetime. We're all from the human race. Yeah. You just froze. Did I freeze or did yes. I? Just, I did or I just was still. No, you were froze for a moment. Now you're good. Okay. Okay. I thought you would try striking a pose. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, this this conversation, thank you very much, has been very, very insightful. Um, oh, Anne Lowe, Josette Jenkins Golette says that Anne Lowe, an African American uh, who designed and sewed oh, yeah. Jacqueline Kennedy, yeah. sewed her wedding dress. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Hercules did the the chef for Washington, George Washington, famous for uh, learning, knowing how to select various types of vegetables and seasonings. And people come from all over the world to to marketplace in Philadelphia to, to watch him cook. Wow. Wow. Kat says, I'm reading a book. We can't talk about that at work. How to talk about race, religion, politics and other polarizing topics by Mary Frances Winters. I highly recommend it. Uh, coming from an HR background, I believe these are topics that we need to talk about and we are, and we're, on, we're not supposed to. I well, want to get that today. The book is, we can't talk about, yeah, we can't, talk, we can't talk about race, religion, politics, but we can tell dirty jokes at work. <laughs> Yeah, these are the things really, if they're talked about in a wholesome setting where people are coming together to learn rather than to uh, debate, debate to learn rather than, than debate, I think it, it can be very, very healthy. Right, I think that one more thing that, 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 that goes with this book, it's not that we can't talk about it, it's that we don't know how to talk about it. We, we seldom have safe spaces where we can be vulnerable in our ignorance because Americans are so proud and arrogant that if you act like, if you behave as if you don't know, then you can't be in the in crowd. And there are some things we just don't know. And you don't know what you don't know until you find out you don't know it. Absolutely. The Timbuktu Report, our goal is to enlighten, to educate and inspire Dr. Rick Stevenson. Thank you so much. Next week, we're going to talk about, continue to talk about race relations. And there was a time in this country during my lifetime when black and white people, it was illegal for black and white people to marry, even though obviously there were those relationships, uh, we wouldn't have gotten the different skin tones. But we're going to talk about black and white 
marriages. If you know somebody who is uh, married um, to someone, and we invite you to uh, have them to join us for the conversation, because it is still an uncomfortable thing for people to talk about today. Yeah. And it can be uncomfortable for those children. Our president of the United States and with a white mother and an African-American, he was from Nigeria, right? Yeah. From, yeah. from Africa. Yeah. But we want to talk about that because we, we have to stop dancing around these topics and right. face them head on. So right. join us next Thursday, same time for the Timbuktu Report. Dr. Stevenson, have a fantastic rest of this week and, and, your, time, and your time on the tennis court. Be safe. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for starting watch parties. We hope that you will come back and be with us next Thursday. Bring a whole team of people with you. We <laughs> love your comments. We love your questions. And thank you for the recommendations um, for the book. We also, on Monday, is Sisters of Wellness. Uh, Josette Jenkins Golette will be our guest. I think it's next week um, to preview her fashion show. And then on Tuesday, our show uh, with Carlos Taylor. Carlos is blind and the show is Insight, Seeing with the Heart. So that is Monday and Tuesday and Thursdays at the Wellness Network, doing its part to inform, to incite, inspire, and encourage all of us to do as God has commanded us to do. Amen. Love ye one another. I like it. Until next time, <laughs> for our entire team at the Timbuktu Report, we thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Make it a great moment. I'm Pamela Marshall at the Wellness Radio TV and at the Wellness Radio TV podcast. Remember, there is healing at the well. No. Take care. <laughs>